our elderly professional horsemen and educate everybody along the way. You're current. You're current. You, you're no. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. And uh, so we, you know, we just embrace you and we are so blessed. We were, um, when we did this, we were hoping to get, you know, 50 people. Marielle has been so generous in uh, supporting the Ameri American Quarter Horse Association and the Association of Professional Horsemen. And they generously um, gave us 50 rooms last night. So if you RSVP'd, you are pro professional horsemen you RSVP'd and you showed up today, your room is gonna be comped for, um, for last night. So thank you, Marielle, for, for, you know, for supporting our industry. And I've gotta tell you, there's a room full of, of men and women in here and we love our horses and we wanna do the very best to take care of our industry, the people coming into our industry and protect our horse. So um, let's get it kicked off. Um, Steve Meadows, is the chairman of our professional horseman council and he's our our fearless leader and uh, has done a great job and he's just going to give us a quick overview of what we've done what we're going to do and uh, thank you again for being here and there are more chairs on the way Take it. good morning i i gotta admit before we get started uh I've been worried all morning. I'm mean, like, man, I hope somebody shows up for this thing. So this is great. I'll tell you, I had no idea. We're so happy to have you guys here. Um, on behalf of Marielle and the Certified Horsemen's Association and the, uh, the Professional Horsemen's Council, I would like to officially welcome you to the Equine Industry Small Business Workshop. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the Professional Horsemen's Council. Um, we are a very small but proud group. Uh, there's 11 members, including myself. And uh, before I get started, I'd like to introduce uh, the Professional Horsemen's Council. If I could, and I'd like for y'all to stand as I introduce you. Um, uh, Krista Baldwin, uh, Whitney Legacy, Sue Saltzy, um, Tom Crawley, Jerry Erickson. Jerry couldn't be with us. Jerry had a horse fall with him, and he's hurt pretty bad, so we, we need to keep him in our prayers. Um, uh, Robin Frid, Tom McBeth, um, Kelly McDowell, Steve Stevens, and last but certainly not least is uh, Jim Searles. So... Uh, we're, we're pretty, it's a very, very good group. Uh, Jim might be a little late. I got a text from Deanna about 2 a.m. Um, of Jim being escorted off the stage by security at the Celine Dion show. So he, he might be just a little bit late. Uh, <laughs> glad I opted not to go on that little event. So um, two years ago, uh, we started a uh, strategic planning, uh, go, our strategic planning goals at the, at the, um, the convention two years, I'm sorry, two years ago, and uh, we set out with a, 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 put a lot of ideas down on paper, and I've got to admit, we have reached most of those goals, and we're very proud of that, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of those goals, and, uh, um, and what we have going on uh, with the professional horsemen. Um, we started the, the Ride the Rail, Ride the Pattern clinics, uh, which are a huge success at all the major AQHA shows, along with the, the Ask a Pro help desk um, that I'm sure if any of you go into the world shows in the novice uh, championships you're, or the level one championships, you're very familiar with, with these uh, two things that give us a lot of visibility within AQHA. Uh, also, um, we uh, started uh, our... Uh, our professional horseman logo to apparel, which we have a little booth set up in the back here, and uh, that's been a real big hit. Oh, Jim finally made it. Uh, <laughs> morning, Jim. How you feeling? How how was the Celine Dion show? 
<laughs> I'm just kidding about that, but I actually do have a picture of Jim being escorted out of a bar by a security uh, by a bouncer one time. So that's a, we'll talk about that later. So um, also last year we had our very first um, online auction for the Professional Horseman's Crisis Fund, and it it went over really well. Uh, with the help of uh, Mike and Stephanie Jennings at the Professional Horse Services, um, we were able to raise over $20,000 um, for the Professional Horseman's Crisis Fund. And, you know, we're, we're just, and this, you know, this workshop, uh, we started this idea not long ago. And for AQHA to give us this opportunity and for you guys to come in early and, and participate, we're, we're so happy to have you here. We have a wonderful group of speakers. Um, to talk to you this morning, and uh, um, so I guess we probably should go on and get started. We got a pretty full agenda. Uh, first, we're going to. Um, uh, I want to introduce our um, AQHA's executive vice president, Mr. Craig Huffines, and uh, let him speak to you here. Thank you so much. Oh, and Craig, I erased your pictures. <laughs> Well, good morning. I, you know, this this event's also called the Rock Star Continuing Education Program. So, there's a lot of folks I see out there in the audience, and I'm stalking you on Facebook because you're all our professional horsemen, and uh, and you inspire me with with the work you've done. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you, and congratulations. It's time for another strategic plan, Steve. That's awesome. Uh, you know, one of the things that I want to relate to you, I see folks from CHA out here, um, many of you professional horsemen, I want you to understand that um, I really feel like the Professional Horsemen Association embodies what the AQHA should always inspire to be. That's uh, inclusive, that's, uh, that's helpful to others, that's reaching out to others to help them get started and that's taking care of your own, and that's special. Uh, and, and that's what all of AQHA should aspire to be, because if we are that, if we are that, we're gonna not only maintain, we're gonna sustain, we're gonna grow, you know, as an association at times when sometimes it's tough to grow. Um, but y'all embody that, and I, and I really, really do uh, appreciate that. The other thing I wanna say is thank you, thank you to Patty uh, for putting this on. Um, la last year when I was here, I was not employed by AQHA. I was kind of on a meet and greet mission. And I met a lot of you. And one of the things that was commonly said was, you know, we need to create a convention that has an opportunity for not just folks sitting on committees, but for others to come and get some value out of it, some education. So, you know, we've been talking to people from the AAEP and, and seeing what they did to create an environment that attracts 9,000 people now to their convention, a mecca uh, for the industry. And we've been talking about, all right, how can we create an educational floor plan that will grow our convention guest list that can get us to a point where perhaps we can have a trade show um, and a place where everybody in the quarter horse business across all of our affiliates, uh, uh, you know, all of our alliance partners can come to do business to talk about industry issues. And I think this group right here this morning has planted the seed for something that's going to grow and it's going to get bigger and we can all be a proud, proud of that. So hopefully you've created a tradition. Hopefully we can create some real value uh, in uh, continuing education, uh, business planning. Uh, you know, all kinds of ideas in developing our business and that we can expand from that. So I want to congratulate you, Steve. Uh, I'm proud to follow you on Facebook and you're a great leader. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Boy, I'm glad I erased his pictures from uh, my phone this morning. <laughs> Um, it, he makes me feel kind of bad because I, I forgot to say something about Patty. I mean, I cannot say enough about this lady. I mean, to tell you, 
Um, she puts the Energizer Bunny in the dirt now. She has one speed, and that's wide open, and she never, never, ever stops representing you guys. And, uh, you know, we got to give her another hand because it is, it is amazing. Um, we have uh, uh, Sam Rose and uh, Dr. Eleanor Green um, from the Animal Welfare Commission would like to speak. Uh, next, so um, let's welcome them and, and hear what they have to say. Um, I, I think we all know who they are, and uh, it, we all agree that animal welfare is a major part of our um, a part of our uh, businesses. So here they are. Good morning, guy. Look through here, and it's uh, a lot of old friends, a lot of people I know. Uh, Eleanor and I have been on the animal welfare since the inception, and uh, what's it been, four years now? Four or five. So anyway, we had a uh, meeting yesterday from 8 till 3, 4 o'clock. Usually, uh, you know, these things don't last that long, but we had a real in-depth view and, and needs that address all of our livelihoods, businesses, whatever. Uh, with that, uh, there's a, just a few things here I want to go over to, uh, I'm sure most of you know. Uh, the, the Animal Welfare Commission, uh, of course, we're all for the horse. We all are. And uh, what I believe is uh, in the past we've came accustomed to some of the things we do to our horses at the shows and we've got immune to a few of these things and I'm as guilty as anybody. So anyway, with that being said, uh, the social media is out there and we have such a uh, deal to hold up and you know when you when, when we somebody sends in maybe not even a member, maybe some are, some's not active. They never send the good slides, photos, they crop them. You'll see something terrible bad there. And really, it's really not. But I just want all of us uh, as professional horsemen to be aware of our surroundings, where we are. It doesn't matter if we're in the show pen, we're in a warm up pen, we're out between the trailers, whatever. There's somebody always watching. So, anyway, uh, it was brought to my attention yesterday in the meeting, and, and I never had really put it together. You know, you see the SPCA with the dogs, all this on the television. Well, you know, they're animals, and our horses are could be right in there with them. So anyway, with that being said, the FBI has a animal cruelty, what am I trying to say? registry that is going to uh, be full and active in 2017. So they're taking a look at it. What we are here today for, and I think all of us here, you know, if, if we're out in the show pen or we're at a show grounds and our best friend's a professional horseman or maybe he's not, he or she, I think it's our duty to go say, hey, you're a little over the line. We need to stop it. And you guys are our boots on the ground for this Animal Welfare Commission. So anyway, uh, make a uh, little bit of a analogy here. We don't have a lot of money to fight these things that we see. But if I, my numbers are right, there's six to eight national animal rights groups and they have exactly probably $7.9 billion a year to work at. So that's what we're dealing with. And anyway, uh, the, the statement that uh, the FBI is using, I'm going to read the highlighted part of it, inflicting excessive or repeated unnecessary pain or suffering. Basically, that's kind of what they got off of our animal welfare mission. So 
I just want everyone to uh, be aware that social media is a killer. And uh, anyway, with that being said, thanks, uh, thanks, great group here today. Uh, I'm sure uh, next time everybody will have their RSVP to get their room paid for. So I know Jim Dudley, he snuck in, got his name on the list, and he wasn't here. So anyway, with that being said, thank you guys. I'll turn it over to Eleanor. Thanks, Sam. First thing I'd like to say is I think AQHA is in great hands today. Craig Huffine's doing a great job. We've got Patty Carter. We've got all these staff now that are really, really working on your behalf. But what I want to say today is that you're the nerve center of AQHA. You are the core of this organization. You are the most knowledgeable out there. You're the ones that others learn from. You're the role models. You're the teachers. You're the one that make this organization hum and keep this industry thriving. And so with that um, comes a, a responsibility. And I, again, I'd like to thank Sam. He, over, he did a great overview of this. He, I think animal welfare is the number one issue facing our industry today. It's also the number one industry facing veterinary medicine, but it is huge in today's world. And things are different than when a lot of us came along, when 98% of the population grew up on farms and understood animals, and now 98% are in the cities. And as they, they do not understand, they do not get it. And they are very turned off by some of the things that we do. And I don't think we need to quit doing the things that we do well and that are okay. We need to educate about that. But the things that we look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know, we really ought to not be doing that, we have got to stop it. And I think that um, if, if uh, Sam said this already, but we've got to hold ourselves accountable. And if we see it, and don't address it, we condone it. And back where he said, y'all ought to address each other and others in a very kind way. And there will be, we have a great stewards program now. And if there's some way you can get some support for that. But again, if we don't address it, we condone it. And, and um, uh, so taking care of a horse, I love this new, um, you know, you hold the reins, um, the horse holds our heart. And, I, and that's a reflection of today's change in the world around us, too. And it is true. They do hold our heart. We all love these horses, and nobody wants to do anything but take care of them. So it's the right thing to do. And the other thing is this industry is going to thrive because of participants. And if we're not taking care of the horses right and the public is turned off by what we're doing, we're not going to attract new members. And that's not going to be good for business. And we're going to go in a downward spiral. And so this is not only what's right for the horse, it also is an economic influencer too. So keep that in mind too. And then also, if we address ourselves, if we police ourselves, police isn't the right word, but if we proactively take care of this horse internally, we're less likely to be taken care of externally but one or the other will happen. And so isn't it gonna be great if AQHA, as it's doing right now, leads the way in animal welfare, shows the world how we are taking the bit in our teeth, so to speak, and that we are preserving this horse, not only for the today, but for tomorrow, and we're gonna attract people. So if we don't police ourselves, again, others are gonna take over, they're gonna come in. Uh, like we said, the FBI has a national incident uh, registry. You might ask yourself why. The reason is, is that people who abuse animals also abuse each other, and those are the, um, um, the, the people who commit crimes on each other, and so the, the FBI has recognized that now. So it'll be very much like sex offenders. Uh, there will be a, uh, an animal abuse person, and they'll be registered, and you can look up in your neighborhood and see how many abusers are in your neighborhood. And, and so I don't think any of the person in this room wants to be on that list where they can, anybody can look you up. You do not want to be on that list. And so we got to make sure that we keep ourselves off of that list and, and um, so that this industry can thrive there. Uh, again, um, um, I, I really want to thank the AQHA for what they're doing, um, uh, the, the transparency, proactivity, um, how many of you in this room are on the Animal Welfare Commission? Stand up, please. Yeah, I've seen a couple of you. All right, here are your representatives. You can, you can get Sam, you can get me, you can get any of these people, anybody on the Animal Welfare Commission. If you have any issues, please, because another thing this organization, thank you, the other thing this organization is trying to do is be transparent, 
connected to members, your opinion matters. So please get with anybody there. You can call me, you can call Patty, you can call Ward, you can call anybody if you have any issues on this. So we're, um, we're pretty excited about this, but the main purpose we're here to tell you today is your role and how important it is for everyone in, in having this industry not only survive, but thrive. And uh, like I said, the world is changing. The other thing about it is animal abuse just used to be something that was, we felt bad about. It's now a felony. Ask the Tennessee walking horse people. There are people in jail and with huge fines now because it's a felony. And so what we want to be doing is defining the rules. We want to say what's okay and what isn't. And so we need to look ourselves in the mirror and when we do that. And we're, we're doing that now. So it's all about helping you. It's all about helping this horse. And it's all about helping this industry. But we need you. And thank you so much. Um, if you have, anybody have any questions on that, I don't want to take much of your program. But no, any questions? None? Okay, well again, thanks to Sam. He's been on this uh, commission since day one, and now he's taken over his chair. He's doing a great job, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Before we get started, there's just uh, two more names I'd like to uh, mention. Uh, Patty just brought to my attention. Um, our incoming president, Sandy Arledge, is uh, uh, the first professional horsewoman to, to uh, become a, an AQHA president. And she's also a uh, former uh, professional horsewoman of the year. And also, um, um, uh, Dr. Hurd, Jim Hurd, is also on the EC, and he's also a professional horseman. So... And he and he's also on our council too. So I, I, I failed to mention him earlier, but uh, but th that uh, that that we're pretty proud of that that, that they're um, that they're being a part. Uh, you know, um, we're getting represented that high up. So it's it's a very good thing. Um, our first presenter um, this morning is uh, our first speaker, uh, Christy Landwer, uh, has been active in the horse industry for more than thirty years. Hunter Jumper, Dressage, Western Pleasure, Hunter Pleasure, and Barrel Racing are just some of the disciplines Christy has competed in at the local, regional, and national levels. She has been teaching children and adults how to ride for more than 25 years. Christy is a master level, uh, master level riding instructor and equine facility manager clinician through the Certified Horsemanship Association and has taught students in 4-H and Pony Club. She also founded, competed, and on, competed on and coached the University of Colorado at Boulder Intercollegiate Horse Show Association equestrian team. Christy is an AQHA professional horseman member, um, a member of the Rocky Mountain Quarter Horse Association, and on the AQHA National Marketing Committee. With an undergraduate degree in public relations and speech communication from California State University Fullerton and a graduate degree in mass communications and journalism from the University of Colorado at Boulder, Christy has vast experience in marketing and business. Cur um, currently, she is a Chief Executive Officer for the Certified Horsemanship, Horsemanship Association, a nonprofit whose Purpose is to promote excellence in safety throughout the horse industry. Please welcome Christy Landwer.
Okay, you're a teacher for your children, you're a teacher for your grandchildren, you're a teacher for your best friend that you're going ahead and maybe being a part of, you're giving them advice. How many of you say, hey, is my butt look big in this? Okay, you're a teacher, right? We're all teachers, we're all educators, okay, all of us are. Now, how many of you are learners? I hope every single hand goes up, right? Don't we all want to learn every day? Absolutely. And what I find happens a lot, not only just in our industry of teaching learning, which of course we're going to talk about today, of teaching uh, good workmanship skills, but also as a whole, is as we are learners, is how we are as teachers. So whatever way you like to learn, you have a tendency to want to teach that way, right? So we're just going to go through a little bit here of how those styles can be very different. And if you are a teacher of whatever it is you're a teacher of, be it horseback riding or whatever the case may be, I challenge all of you to be a learner and a teacher in all the different ways that there are. So let's see about the quick oh, look, it works. So, somebody's beginning to learn how to post, okay? We've all seen it, we've all been there, done that, for those of us that have ridden a long time, right? We stand up in our shirts, we do all those kinds of things. So what I want to challenge you with as we go through this right now, these five bullet points are kind of an overall emphasis of how we learn and an overall emphasis of how we teach. So this can be posting truck. This can be correct lead at the camp. This can be first camp. This can be first load. This can be going over a cross rail. This can be anything. This can be learning how to rock climb for the first time. This can be learning how to ice skate. Okay, whatever the case may be. So as we go through this, kind of think to yourself, which one am I? Which one of these, or am I all of these? But maybe I have some that are higher in how I like to learn and some that are lower in how I like to learn. So the first one, if we're going to do posting trot, we're going to say the physical skill. So those are the learners that like to know the physical skill of the movement. Right? So if we're going to be posting the trot, they love to do it at the halt, and they love to go, what muscles do I activate? What do I do to get this job done? So what are some of the muscles we activate in posting trot? Hopefully, not our ankle, because we're not using the stirrup, right? So hopefully our upper inner thigh, our calf, our core muscles, those types of things, right? So the cognitive people are the fats. So they want to not only know the muscles, but they want the detail of it. All right, so are we talking upper inner thigh? Are we talking down here by my knee? Do you want me to pinch with my knee, or do you want me to keep my knee slightly open? What exactly do you want? Okay, those are the physical ones that really are on the cognitive side of things. Just the fats, man. They want to know, why am I bothering doing this? What's the point? Okay, the next one is our conceptual learners. These are going to be our reasoners. These are going to be the ones that say, oh boy, move like for my job. Okay, okay so these are the reasoning people. All right, these are the ones that are saying, okay, what is the trot? And you say, well, trotting is a two-beat game, and it works off diagonal pairs of legs. Therefore, we can have a correct posting diagonal. Okay, trotting is not a pace which is same side legs, and can you post a pace? No, okay? So therefore, the reasoning people want to know exactly why. Why do we bother doing this? How is posting? Why do we even bother? So you have to talk about trying as a two-beat gate, it's not a four-beat gate like walk, it's not a three-beat gate like low canter, so on and so forth, okay? So the next one is gonna be your effective people, your feelers. Okay, these are going to be your highly emotional people that want to have a reaction when they go horseback riding, which is the love and the bond and all those things, which most of us have, but to varying degrees, correct? So for these people, the first thing they're going to ask you is, I don't like hurting the horse that I'm on by slamming down on his back when I post. I don't think that's good. And you can tell them, well, the reality is if you're on a rough horse, you're probably going to slam down on their back or at the sitting trot than you ever are at the posting trot. So let's teach you how to post the trot so you don't have to worry about that. Okay? They're also going to be the ones that you can talk about hand movement and how you don't want to bump the horse in the mouth as you're posting. Right? You want to keep your hands nice and low and not actually do that to hurt the horse. Okay? Those are your effective folks you're feeling. Your last ones are your problem solvers. Okay, how many of you like to solve problems? Puzzles, those kinds of things. All right, these are your problem solvers. So their first question to you as you're teaching them how to post is going to be, well, what's the problem I stop solving? Why should I even bother posting? What's the problem? And you can say, whether you're riding in an English saddle or a Western saddle, if you check fence for many, many miles, do you want to sit the entire time? No. Okay, it's going to hurt you after a while. 
My virtual horse is back after a while, especially for those that go on really long trail rides, for example. You're out checking fence. Heck, you're in the raining paddle getting ready to go in, and you rainers know you trot, don't you? You don't just lope. You might just lope when you actually get in the show pen, you do a lot of trot to warm up your horse's virtual And again, do a lot of people post, regardless of Western or the saddle of horse things. So your problem solvers are going to say, why do we bother? Hard to sit on a rough horse. It's going to help your seat bones after a while, and it's going to help your horse's back. So take a moment before we go on to the next slide and kind of think to yourself, do I learn in all five of these ways? Or do I learn some much more than the other? And now for those of you that are teachers, which is all of us, okay, even if it might not be in horseback riding, which one of these things do we do the most when we teach? Which one of these five things is the key? So when you do a learning process, you have a plan. Okay? So for most of us as professional horsemen, we're going to go out and we're going to teach something, whether it's in the arena or out on the trail or whatever we're doing, we have preparation ahead of time, correct? So we're going to set up our poles like this, we're going to put maybe some cones out, we're doing a horsemanship pattern, we're going to do these kinds of things. I think one of the hardest things we do as an instructor is horse-rider combination. Okay? How many of you have school horses in your program? You have lots of horses that you teach on, okay? How many of you have um, beginners come to you with their own horse, whether they're leasing it or they own it, and that horse is not right for them? Yeah. And that's one of the hardest things, right? It's either not right as in it's not going to meet their goals because it's not enough horse, or it's not right for them because it's going to hurt them. Okay? And then we've got our liability on the line, then we've got our risk management that has to kick in, and we say, boy, I hope I'm really up to date with my professional liability insurance. Or we have to say, I'm sorry, but you have to put that horse in training with me. And they think immediately, money grab. Or you think, okay, you're going to have to take some more riding lessons on these school horses before you can ride your own horse. Again, money grab. But we have to have that preparation. I think it's one of the hardest things we do as instructors is horse rider combo, especially when they come to us already having made the decision and didn't ask us for our opinion. So the next one is the explanation of the skill. Okay, so going back to posting trot, what is the explanation? What is it about? Why do we do it? Then a demonstration. So we're obviously getting in here to our visual learners, right? When we do the actual demonstration. I just want to go ahead and show something. So if I'm going to demonstrate to my visual riders, and I'm going to demonstrate plumb line, okay? Heel, you and me, plumb line. And I'm going to say heel, elbow, hip, ear. This is where I want you to sit. It's like you're riding a big blue ball, right? This is what I want. Then I say to my visual learners, so you don't want to do this and collapse forward with your pelvis. You don't want to do this and rock back. You truly want to be in the middle, but then you don't go back to the middle you stay here or you stay here, what you've just done to all of your visual learners, even though they heard you say it's not correct, you've emblazoned on their mind the wrong thing. Because visual learners aren't listening to you. Okay? They're not. They are seeing what's going on. So if you're going to have a demonstration, let's say you're going to have more advanced rider who's out there with you, or you're going to hop on yourself and show a skill, you better do it right. You better not be posting on the wrong diagonal and saying it's correct. You better not be on the wrong lead and saying it's correct. Because that visual learner is going to see that. Even if you want to demonstrate incorrect, always end with correct. Very, very helpful for our visual learners. So the demonstration, the application is the meat of the lesson. Whether you teach for 45 minutes, an hour, whatever you do, that's the meat. Uh, the correction. This is where we can lose some people, right? Do we have an industry right now where there are so many other things that they could be doing besides horseback riding, especially when we're talking beginning adults and young children. Okay, one of the biggest things that we compete with is this. Okay, the video game and those kinds of things. The next biggest thing that we compete with is all the sports. And is horseback riding a sport? Absolutely it is. And does it take practice and determination and all these things? Absolutely it does. So we want to make sure that when we correct, we are correcting them. I get very upset when I hear people say that's perfect. I don't know about you, but when I get given a 1 to 10, I don't give 10s very often. I give 9 pluses. I give 8.9s, but I'm not, you can always be a little bit better, right? You always can. So as coaches and as instructors, we have to go ahead and keep going towards that goal, but we don't want to correct like this. Hey, you, that really sucked. Maybe you need to do a different sport. Okay? And how many of you have had riding instructors that have yelled at you? Oh yeah. I can think of a few key ones, not in the quarter horse industry, but in the hunter jumper industry that yell a lot. He actually is known for it. Okay? So yes, yelling is definitely part of what can sometimes happen, and that can possibly scare away the parents. 
and that will possibly scare away the children. So it's called correction with a smile. Okay, it's correction with a smile. And if you're teaching a group writing lesson, how many of you teach group lessons? Anybody? Very good. How many of you teach only private? Okay, so a little bit of both. So if you're teaching a group lesson, instead of saying, hey, Patty, you really need to do this, you can probably say, hey, everybody, let's think about this right now. And the likelihood is six out of the eight people you're working with are having that same problem Kathy's is. And if not, they can correct themselves and go, oh, I'm doing it right. So either way, we're still doing that correction with a smile. So the next one is the understanding. Some of us are introverted. Raise your hands. Okay. Some of us are extroverted. Raise your hands. Okay. And most of the time, whether you're teaching an introvert or an extrovert, that's going to determine how they are listening to you and how they're responding. Okay, so you're not going to sometimes know whether or not your introverts are understanding what's going on. You're not going to know that because they're going to be very into themselves and doing what they're supposed to be doing. They might be doing it right, but they might have some confusion. They're probably not going to say, hey, Miss Christie, I have a question. They're, they might not do that. So you want to make sure to always have a conversation with your students about their understanding. Your repetition and review, they say that 60% of what we say actually gets listened to. So if you say heels down to nauseam, guess what? You're saying heels down to nauseam because they have to hear it. Okay? If you're saying open up the outside brain, use your inside leg to get your horse deep in the corner to nauseam, it's probably because they need to hear it. Okay? So we repeat, repeat, repeat. And the last one is evaluation and encouragement of our writers, of course. But evaluation, and I would say not for your students, I would say of yourself. So evaluation of, did I do the right horse rider combination today? Did I do the right thing in regards to um, how I set up this particular course to have success? Those kinds of evaluations. So the learning process is very progressive skill building, right? We're not going to teach somebody to do a flying lead change until they know how to do a simple. Okay, it's kind of reality. So we kind of build upon things. And so we always start with the more simple and we move to the more complex. Do we have to assume that there are holes in our students' knowledge? Yes. So, how many people have heard this? So are you intermediate, beginner, advanced, or are you? Oh, I'm advanced. OK, excellent. Why are you advanced? Because I went on a trail ride in Estes Park. <laughs> Fabulous. That's great. Glad you went on a trail ride in Estes Park. But you're not advanced, Okay. And I'm a big believer, how many of you have gone to those dude string rental places and you say you're an advanced rider and they bring Widowmaker out from the back 40? <laughs> and then you get the privilege of being able to train Widowmaker and you're paying for that privilege? Yeah, you never say you're an advanced rider, guys. You say you're an intermediate rider when you go on those trail rides. And then you get the nice little mare that does whatever you want. It's really lovely. You don't say you're beginners and you have to take a lot, but you certainly don't say you're advanced. So we're going to get that a lot with the people that we teach, right? Because who really knows beginner, intermediate, and advanced? Is everyone's definition of that, especially in our industry, different? And if you think you're advanced, go try a different discipline, right? If you think you're advanced, go try to do something outside of your comfort zone. You quickly go, wow, I'm really still a beginner in the whole thing, which is good, right? It's that constant wanting to learn. So always assume that there are holes, and always teach theory. Okay? I think our six-year-old kids benefit as much from theory as our adults that have been doing it forever. They want to know why. Why can't we ride with our to toes pointed straight down? Why do we have to have our heel either level or slightly lower than our toe? Why? And if you personally don't know the answer that students sometimes ask, go find out. Google's not always the way to find out. But call up you know, another professional horseman or whatever the case may be and find that out. Because I was asked the other day, if anyone knows the answer to this besides it looks like it, I'd love to know. Why is it called the frog? Why is the bottom of the hook that looks like a triangle called the frog? Does anybody know? Okay, I can't find it on Google either. So I've been looking. So it's those kinds of questions, right? And those are fun questions. You can ask those things as well. But always teach the theory. And then I challenge all of you to think about ability. Ability equals your skill, but also your knowledge as to why you do it. So if you're very good at X, Y, Z, that's great. But can you teach it to somebody else? Because isn't that the true definition of mastery knowledge is once you can teach it yourself? So even those of you that don't teach writing, occasionally teach writing. Teach your friend, teach your son, teach your daughter, teach your spouse, teach your partner, teach your neighbor. Just a little something to see if you've mastered it, because that will really kind of show where your holes are as a teacher. So obviously the three main types of learners are what? And then overall in marketing are thing. You've got visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, correct. Okay? And those are still the biggest ones. I always love to start with that first slide I did.
did though with the five bullet points, because I think those are much more involved. But overall, the visuals, they love to actually have people um, get on and show them something. They have vivid imagination, so even while you're talking, they're visualizing. They've already moved ahead. If you say the writing lesson today is going to consist of a raining pattern, this is what it looks like, they've moved ahead, and they're doing this bit in the slides, and they're moving ahead. <coughs> Visual learners are always doing those things. We already talked about incorrect body position is an issue. So then you have your auditory learners. Your auditory learners love the writing instructor experience. They love the listening, they love the talking, they love that interaction. And that's where they thrive. Um, but not very many people in the population are just auditory. Many of us are a combination. So again, think to yourself as we're going through this, am I visual, auditory, kinesthetic, am I all three? Much like we did on those other bullet points, you'll kind of see the type of um, blurb you are. And then of course the kinesthetic folks. They love to get on and they love to show it. The problem with the kinesthetic folks, if you have them all lined up in the middle of the room and you're starting to tell them this is what we're going to go do today, they have zoned out. They are not paying attention to you at all. You're like the Snoopy Peanuts character. Wah, 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 wah. They want to go out and do it. They want to get motivated and do it right away. Our kinesthetic people are all about action. So, Patty wanted me just really quickly just to give you just a little bit of information about Certified Horsemanship Association. Um, there are quite a few of you in the room that have even hosted clinics for us, so thank you for that, or you're a certified instructor yourself, and we appreciate that. I'm going to have one or two of them talk to you here in just a second, just so really quickly when we have to go through this. So we have been around since um, 1967, so we're not quite 75 years like AQHA, but we will be at 50 years next year. Um, we started off years ago in what was called the CAMP, the First Bishop Association, and we had a uh, gentleman how many of you started riding or know people that have started riding in camp? Girl Scout, Boy Scout, YMCA, those, those types of things. So that's where a lot of the masses first get their first riding lessons. So he had a Girl Scout program that he ran, and he would say, all right, you're dance riders, go ahead and come, and you're now going to be my staff counselor, and we're going to do an eight-hour staff training the next day, here we go. So at one particular time, he asked for the advanced riders to come in. And for those of you who works at universities and colleges, are you noticing that some of the students you're getting now may not be as ag-related as they used to be, may not be coming in with quite the skills in the horseback riding world that they used to? Okay, so this gentleman had this 50 years ago. Because he used to be able to say, hey, come in your advanced grade, here we go. Well, this particular time he had them come in, he had the girls that were going to be counselors go out into the pasture to get their horses, and one of them must have been the leader, and they all must have followed her, because they all came out like unicorns. With the lead ropes attached right here. The halter is upside down and backwards. And he went, oh my goodness, we have a problem in Houston. I have all the cameras coming tomorrow, they can't even follow her. So he created our very first composite manual of horsemanship, level one through four, to basically be staff trained. So if somebody said, I'm a CHA level two rider, or I'm a CHA level two horseman, they would know that that means you can walk, jog, and get in camera mode. Okay, so they kind of had this kind of framework to work off of, instead of what is advanced, what is beginner. So they kind of came up with, with that framework. If you come and get certified by us now, in the 80s we changed our name to Certified Horsemanship Association. Still about 40% of our members are teaching um, camping, and 60% of our members are now professional horsemen in different breed discipline associations, they're university and college horsemanship coaches. They are traveling trainers that go from barn to barn, or they have a small program on their own property. Those are who 60% are now. We truly believe that if you can teach six to eight up, you can probably handle a private writing lesson, but we don't know for sure if you can write well a private lesson and handle six to eight up. And we want to make sure that all of our instructors are able to make the most money they can. And quite frankly, they can make more when you teach six to eight up per hour, of course you can, than when you're teaching a private. So that's kind of our reasoning behind that. But if you come to us, safety is first. That's obviously what we care about, not only for the riders, but for the horses. And then your horsemanship skill level, your actual teaching ability, your group control, your horse and herd management, and then of course professionalism, that would never be a problem with this group. So our main areas of certification, we do about 100 clinics around the U.S. and Canada every year. Um, we're in all 50 states and almost every province in Canada at this point. And the biggest thing I want to say is that there's no CHA way to teach. So we don't say this is how you have to teach this. We say is it safe? Is it effective? Is there good theory? Is there good horsemanship? Is there good position corrections going on? Are you kind but honest? 
all of those kinds of things. There's no CHA way to teach anything. Oops, sorry. I see my button too much. See, it's telling it must be 920. That's why I was doing it. So, with that in mind, and it looks like it is almost 920, um, I just want to go ahead and just give an opportunity to a couple of our members right now and also people that have been involved with um, AQHA for a really long time to talk. Um, Ann Rizicki is at Middle Tennessee State University. Um, she is hosting a clinic for us in May. She's a master instructor for us and a clinician, and she also has hosted not only clinics for us, but she'll be also hosting our international conference this fall. And unlike a convention where we're in a hotel all the time, when you come to our convention, we all get on and ride horses for two full days. So we teach one another different skills. So we always love it when a university says, yes, they'll host us because they have great school horses and great time. So with that, Anne, if you just want to share a little bit about your experience with us. Sure. I think um, I was pretty nervous about it at first. And I've been doing this all my life. and want to find out I've been doing it wrong all my life. And that's not how it turned out at all. I think um, the AQHA surveys and the programs we've done have shown us over the last few years that the folks who are going to spend seven days at the horse show all the time are aging out. And probably the most important people that we've got to address are the new folks coming in, the ones who did not grow up with a horse in their backyard, the ones that come from the cities. The ones who are going to vote against us when we need our public to understand what the horse industry really is. And so the Certified Horsemanship Association, I think, is a great match for us as professionals. <coughs> it's going to help us bring all those first touch people in and keep them, not just for the one trail ride. They're going to be able to understand what being around horses is really worth to people and how people and horses are good for each other. So I invite you all to um, explore this, uh, the clinic process, the certification process. The networking possibilities are incredible. Um, I can't even tell you how many people I've had to send to others for lessons since I got my name on that list. Um, and we are hosting our clinic this year uh, with an emphasis. I think my mission is to help get the professional horsemen more involved in this. This clinic is May 16 to 20 at Middle Tennessee State University. So anybody who'd like to ask me about it or come and visit with us, please do. Um, Andy Mormon's in the back. She's a master instructor as well. It's Carla Wenberg here. Um, Cheryl Cronberg's up front, <coughs> Tracy Cackert. Um, I don't know all of you, but there are quite a few of us in here, and we'd love to have more. Thanks. educators and not the police.